Well, this morning, I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. We're going to look at two verses. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is kind of a perennial message that I preach every year because it's important. It's, it's very important that we look at the difference between religion and how we can get caught up in religion. But it's, it is about a relationship with Jesus. So Mark chapter 2, just two simple verses. Um, Ma Matthew is one of the disciples. And in the book of Matthew, he's called Matthew. But in the book of Mark, he's called Levi. Same guy. Okay, so this is, this is Matthew, the tax collector. But for obvious reasons, I chose this text because my son's name is Levi. And I've actually given him this scripture and, and said, uh, you know, this is, this is Jesus calling you. And, uh, but he's, he's walking with the Lord, so he's quite, quite pleased with this. Okay, Mark chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. And I'm going to catapult off of this and give you a history lesson from here. Once again, Jesus was, went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. It's such a simple thing, isn't it? But that wasn't a simple thing to do. And Jesus... First of all, he was, he had a reputation of hanging out with sinners. Well, so what does he do? Out of the whole crowd, he gets, he gets one of the people that the culture hated because he was the tax collector. And he says, hey, follow me. Jesus didn't care about his reputation. He cared about people. He cared, he loved people. And Levi left everything and followed him. See, Jesus, when, when he came, he was a terrible salesman. Terrible. I mean, at one point, when he had fed the, the 4,000, and then fed, fed the 5,000, and fed the 4,000, and then the crowd started gathering, he goes, you're not following me because you want me. You're following me because you're hungry. Well, let me tell you, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have anything to do with me. <laughs> That's terrible marketing. Jesus, <laughs> that is not something. And so people left. He wasn't coming to build his kingdom, to overthrow Rome, right? And, and all the things that people thought the Messiah was going to do. He came to change the culture. He, he came to change the system. The system in the Old Testament was this. If, if, you, if you sinned, you had to go to the temple if you sinned. When you sinned, you had to go to the temple and you had to offer a sacrifice that the priest would then chop up and burn, so an animal, usually a spotless lamb, and you would have a blood sacrifice and, and that would atone for your sin. Then you could go on your way. God was in the center of that, in the Holy of Holies. You had the outer court that everybody could go to, the inner court where, where the priest would take your sacrifice, and right there in the inner court was the brazen altar where the animal would be sacrificed for the atonement of your sin. And then there was the holy place, and beyond the holy place was the Holy of Holies. That's where the presence of God was. It was the best God could do to get close to us. It actually shows how desperate He is for us. We just sang how desperate we are for Him. He's desperate for us. We are in His image. And He desires to be with us. Otherwise, He wouldn't put up with all this stuff. Would he? So Jesus came knowing that He was going to bring in a new system. That the temple was no longer needed. Now, his blood, when he shed it on the cross, would cover our sins so completely that now 
we are declared righteous and holy. Do you, do you realize that? You're declared righteous and holy. Not, thank God that my freedom wasn't based on what I've done. Amen. But on His mercy and the power of His blood. The power of His blood is that you are now saved. So Jesus came not to make a whole bunch of friends, but to change the system. So He actually looked at the temple with His disciples and said, See that building? My paraphrase is, you're not going to need it anymore. He said, not one stone will be left on the other. And he wasn't weeping over it. And he wasn't saying, so we're going to build another one. No, he was saying, you're not going to need that anymore. The priests who, as much as we look at the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests that were giving Jesus a hard time, they were doing their job. They were there to protect the system, the old covenant. Okay? And so when a guy comes on the scene and says, I'm God, you need to protect, you need to protect the system from this lunatic, right? And so they were doing their job, so they gave him a hard time. But Jesus essentially, with his blood, disassembled the need for the priesthood. And they knew it. Which is why when Jesus rose from the dead and the soldiers saw the stone roll away, and after they got up from fainting, they went right to the right to the priests, and they told them what happened. And the priest went, "Oh no, he did rise from the dead." So he paid off the soldiers not to say anything. You don't pay off soldiers not to say anything unless you believe that it was true, and tell the story that the disciples told about it. By the way, so Jesus was disassembling the need for the priests. The priests were closer to God than others in the Old Testament because they were constantly doing sacrifices for themselves so that they could remain in the inner court and the holy place. The high priest was the closest one to God because he did tedious sacrifices and rituals that God ordained to get into the holy of holies, into the presence of God once a year. So there was this hierarchy that the, that the you know the, the 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 higher you were in church leadership, the closer you were to God. But Jesus disassembled all that. In fact, he, he looked at the at the at, at the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests, and and he would come, he would say, you know, like you're out in the in the streets and you've taken this taken this position that God has given you that was needed for this old system and look how proud you are you whitewashed tombs he would say you look you look good on the outside but inside is death he would he would kind of tease them about their audacious clothing now God in the books of the law he clothed the priests there was an ordained clothing but the priests now he says you wear your phylacteries wide you know, like the 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 the, uh, the scarf that the priest was wearing. He's like, you guys have just turned into to pompous jerks, essentially. Although, you know, you think that's bad. He called them a brood of vipers. So I don't know which one would you rather be called. But he was disassembling the need for the old system, the temple, the priesthood, the sacrifices. All of that, with the blood of Jesus, is now gone. He turned a corner. That's why we call your Bible split into two major sections. The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now that would be a big pill to swallow. The other thing is, people like to work for what they get. So the old system was based on works. I got to bring my animal, I got to, you know, and the priests have to do the sacrifice, works, 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 works. The atonement was all based, though it was God's idea, it was based on works. Jesus comes, disassembles the need for all that, and simply says, come to me. Believe in your heart that I am Lord, confess with your mouth that I am Lord, and you are saved. What do we do? Thanks to Adam and the curse when he was kicked out of the garden, God says, you're going to toil over everything. God comes, Jesus comes, who is God. God put flesh on and came to us and made this simple covenant of salvation through his work on the cross 
through his torture, through his blood, through his taking the keys of hell and death, through his resurrection, he did all of it. And we just have to believe. And what do we do? We throw toil all over it. Oh boy, we, I have to do this, I have to do that. You know, and, 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 you, and, and what do we do? We try to earn our salvation instinctively because of that sin nature in us that Jesus died for. Think of the irony of that. So Jesus changes the system. The book of Acts, we see people getting it, most of them. There were other people called the Judaizers that went, no, the, the old system, we need to hold on to that. This Jesus is, he's a fraud. And so you, you see the tension in the book of Acts, but you see people coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, the, and, and it, was, it was the culture around them that called them Christians. A Christian is still a follower of Jesus Christ. Look at our text. What did, what did Jesus say to Levi? You know, if you have a red letter Bible like me, with Jesus' words in red letters, he said, follow me. Not, hey Levi, follow me. We're going to gather every Sunday to sing songs and listen to, to preachers. It'll mostly be me, but you know, we'll let other people take a turn. And there's going to be an offering, and we can greet one another, and we're going to do this every week. <clears throat> no. He said, follow me. A Christian, by the way, I, I'm determined to take that word back. Because, you know, yeah, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a good person. No, that's not what a Christian means. A Christian is a follower of Jesus Christ. Christ? Christian. Christian. It's a follower of Jesus. And going, it's, it's, are you a Christian? Yeah, I go to church. No. It's a follower of Jesus Christ. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. <laughs> yeah. It's a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not a place. It's, it's, not, it's not works. So after Jesus dies, rises from the dead, fills believers with his spirit, the church starts to grow. Believe the body of Christ starts to grow. Then Rome gets burned down. Christians are blamed for it. Led by that Paul, that terrible guy, Paul. What happens? Christianity goes into hiding. For 300 years, it goes into hiding, and it grows, and grows, and grows, and grows. Then, in the 4th century, early in the 4th century, a Roman emperor named Constantine comes into power. His mom has some Christian influence in her life. We don't know exactly what that is. I mean, we're talking 1,600 years ago, so, or 1,700 years ago, we can speculate, but we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. So, Constantine, I think through honoring his mother, and probably he had some Christian influence too, he does the worst thing that could ever happen to Christianity. He makes it the state religion. In come the buildings. In comes the priesthood. In comes all the, the, the sacrificial stuff that we see in, in a lot of churches today, especially in the Catholic Church. In comes, in comes baby dedication. You know, if you, if, you don't, if you don't baptize your baby into the church, then they're going to go to limbo if they die. In comes purgatory, which is not found in the Bible. In comes confessionals, which is not in the Bible. In fact, the opposite is in the Bible. It says there is no mediator between God and man except Jesus Christ. And in comes this church and state. And in comes everything that Jesus came to abolish. You see, what we're doing here. Of course, in, in the in the you know later in the 1500s, I believe Martin Luther comes in and, and creates reform, reform from this Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. That's not a bad word. 
In fact, that's a great Christian word. The, so, so this is what happens. Martin Luther, who was a Catholic monk, takes takes the Bible and writes what's, what's famously known as the 99 Thesis. And he takes 99 things that the Catholic Church was teaching from Constantine, making it the world religion, by the way. And so this is a, this is a 1,200 years later, he writes 99 things that he didn't see in the Bible. And he nailed it to the door of the church so that when people came the next morning, they were furious. He didn't want to create a protest. He want, he was the reformer. He wanted to reform. So what happened out of that is it created two groups, the reformers and the protesters. The protesters looted the church, churches and killed the priests and, and were just furious. Well, that's where we get the word, the root word, Protestant. And we brag about it. We, Protestant churches, every Protestant church was formed by protesting against every other one. They didn't see anyone doing it right, so I'm going to create my own protest. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just been such a convoluted history. So you have, you have this, this dog's breakfast of diversity and understanding and what I want to do with this message is show you where it came from so that we can, we can understand what we're doing here even this morning. This is not God's idea. Whether you're doing it in a church or in a banquet hall, this is not God's idea. But it's a good idea. The difference between God's idea and a good idea is religion versus relationship. If this is God's idea, then we must meet every Sunday. We must sing some songs. We must preach from the Word. We must do this Sunday morning. We must have an offering. We must have, have fellowship. No, it's not God's idea. It's a good idea and He blesses it. But when it becomes God's idea, it's religion. Ah, oh, I miss church. I really know the songs. Like I just, I'm not musical. I just really don't get that. It's okay. It's okay. Relationship means I come here because I want to be fed. Because I want to. God's been so good to me this week. I just want to lift up my voice to him. I said earlier in worship, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I just want, I just want to explode and brag about God in song and in, and in word because he's been so good to me. That's the difference. But unfortunately, churches, and, and, I, and I guard against this for, for here. They, they can turn into businesses, right? And, and we have to keep going. We have to keep the business going. We gotta keep the blood flowing through the, through the business. And, and, and the, the, the pastor is the employee, the hired hand, instead of the shepherd. Or it can become a social club. I remember the church that I grew up in. For my parents, they were they were Christians, but then they had this born again experience. <laughs> they gave their lives to Jesus. They said, "Jesus, come into me. Let's walk together." And they came into a relationship with Jesus. And all of a sudden, the blinders came off to the church that we were in, and they went. There's a, the, the church started calling my dad the evangelist because all of a sudden he's talking about Jesus as if he's this real person instead of this person that we talk about in our social club so that we can call it a church. Or churches can be something that we do to appease God. He's angry and a little bit aloof, I think. And if he looks my way, 
I want to be able to say I went to church every week. I sang those songs. Some of them were pretty archaic and the music style that I don't understand anymore, but I sang them. And I listened to that preacher. He wasn't very good, but I listened to him every single week because I know that that's what you want me to do. And the God of the Bible would go, no. I want you to walk with me. Follow me. Don't follow me to a building. Don't follow me to a bunch of songs. If, if you're singing these songs out of vain religion, don't do it. Don't do it. Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 6 about vain repetition. If you're praying to me to appease me, don't do it. I'm prophesying over you right now. Amen. I'm speaking the words of God to you right now. If, if, if the preacher that you sit under is not feeding you, don't go. Sit on your front porch and read the Bible. Find a good friend to talk about the Lord with. That's church. That's the body of Christ. But we've, we've created a business or a social club, or we do it at a vain religion because well, God wants me to do this, doesn't he? I'm telling you this morning, be free. Be free from it all. Our, our gathering here, it's funny, because it's, it's almost a different group every week. We even noticed that when we were in the park, it was a different group again. If, I mean, the email list is over 100 strong. And if, if everybody came at the same time, we'd have some issues. And sometimes I think, why don't they come all at the same time? And every once in a while, God goes, yeah, you still got a little bit of that religion in you. When there's a couple weeks that we don't have this, don't have anywhere to go, oh, my religious sense just goes off. Oh, my goodness. What's going to happen? And then Crystal and I post something on the Sunday. We feed everybody, and there's over 500 views. You know, like, it, it's not about the form. It's not about the place. There is something beautiful about coming together. The Bible does say where two or more are gathered. There's a few things that happen. Where two or more are gathered, I am there in the midst. His manifest presence felt it this morning. I feel it right now. Where two or more are gathered, where two or more agree on one thing, it will be done. You know? So there is something beautiful about and I do miss it. I, I battle the religious of, oh, I can't, I can't miss a week. But then when I really dig deep, it's like, I miss, I miss worshiping with you folks on those weeks that we don't have any. But I think that's the beauty of what we have here is that sometimes we can't and we realize we miss it. So the next week we come together and you sing like you were singing. And as I'm preaching, I'm looking at every one of you are hungry for the word of God. I like that. You're not here at a vain repetition or vain religion. You're here because you want to experience the presence of God and you want to be fed with the word. Religion is our attempt to get to God. But Christianity is God's attempt to get to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should just believe not perish have everlasting life it's simple don't make don't toil over it God loves you so much I, you know one of the one of the best things COVID brought to our planet other than patios <laughs> was we had to redefine globally what church was Oh, I like that. I'm getting shivers just thinking about it. I think God sent us all to our room. Think about what you've done. <laughs> and we had to redefine what church is. It's the body of Christ. 
It's simply the body of Christ. And, and you know, we have our relationship with Jesus. And it's coming into relationship with each other. That's it. And so it makes sense that we come into a room, that we come into a building and all the rest of it. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not saying that any of what we do under the guise of church is wrong. But what I'm saying is it's not God's idea, but it's a good idea, and He blesses it. Remember when at the church I formerly led, or was, was pastoring at, I, God had me pursue the Capitol Theater. Do you remember that? That almost split the old church. One of the things, I remember having one of our town hall meetings, you know, where everybody could just express, and uh, we had a great team that was presenting the numbers and everything led by Jerry Wolfe, and it was just fantastic. We were pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. We didn't have, you know, sparkles in our eyes, like, oh, the Capitol Theater could be ours. We were, we, I was obeying God in pursuing that, and one of the most amazing things that came out of it, and I don't think a lot of people got it, though I articulated it as much as possible. They said, what if, what if we did go to the Capitol Theater and we sold the building that we were in? And then what if it didn't work out at the Capitol Theater? Would we still be a church? And there were a lot of people that could not say yes. We don't exist for a building. We exist because Jesus saved us and has brought us into relationship with him and with each other. As he walked along, he saw Levi. Wow. Sitting at the tax collector's booth. And he simply said, 